Greetings. You have come as well. Come to join my wending way through this old and reeky bar, or as my father would say, that dreech and sinful hoose. Do not fear. Of the ghosts you will meet, you will not be one of them. He walks only in my memory. But come, let me introduce myself. I am John Dixon, though most just call me Young Belchester. I know this town well. The wines and closes I will lead you down I have wandered many times and seen the faces grow old, change, and be replaced. You have come to hear the memories of this place, dig out the echoes, and I will call them to you. We will pause along the way, rest the feet, so you can listen closely. When I draw you into the very moment the events we tell stained their history upon the town, I will give you the signal. It will sound like this. So, forget the present, where life is conceived and walks into the light. We go into its eternal shadow that looms forever behind. Around you it is 1650. There is no wall behind or houses to your right. You stand on a grass slope that runs from the Esplanade and Castle down to the cluster of houses around the open market below that we call Grass Market. You're at the edge of a noisy, bustling, walled town surrounded by moors, cropped fields and pastures. In normal times, it was thriving, but now, in this moment of 1650, the countries of Scotland and England, Ireland and Wales are embroiled in civil war. The traitor, Cromwell, comes to depose the Christian and decadent king, Charles I. He brings his army across the Tweed, some 40 miles from here, and with his cannons and muskets, he lays war and siege about him. Scottish troops are amassed about this town, on the esplanade, in the squares, here where you stand around a fire. The cows and sheep have been brought behind the walls. It is night. You hear that, Tom? Calm yourself, lad. I thought I heard a drum. The wind. I hear that they laid Reed Hall under cannon. I was there not three days ago. It said they took out the men and women and stripped them naked, put them in irons and scourged the lot. Aye, we shouldn't hope for better. Prisoners are ill-used. But at least they live in. Just look among the hospitals and think how we leave the deed. Aye, Mary. Some of the soldiers have been saying how they've seen some of them deed rising. Tales, lad. Tales of tired men shooken up by the battle. You think, Tom? I've seen deed soldiers enough to carpet the field, and not one of them got back up. I don't know. I've seen one, I'm sure. I read home, just before I left and English came. Not much like now, but a cloud in the sky that the moon will less bright. I went most by myself for the others dozed. I heard it first. A faint drumming coming from the trees. It were like raindrops to begin, but it kept on a steady rhythm and grew louder. I thought to shout, but I was rooted. And a cold came over me worse than night could give. Then, among the edges, I saw a figure. Small, the shape I'd say of a little boy appear. It was hard to see in the shadows, but you could see thin arms laying a tattoo on a drum around its neck. There was something wrong about him, but I couldn't say what. His drumming woke the others and kept them to the trees, I reckon. That is a tall tale, lad. We don't need to worry about ghosts. The English are all we need to listen for. Maybe it were a warning. The English did come after. That did. What was that? Keep yourself sober, lad. I'm wished. Uh, I hear it, I hear it coming. You hear nothing but the wind. There it is again. It can't be out. Look! Oh, look! Look! Oh, just say hell. It's come again. It's the small boy. Come, lad. Still your fancy. You can see him coming from the foot of the rocks below the castle. The moon shows him right enough tonight. He's wrong. Where's his head? Where's his head? Where's his head? What devil breaks him? Come back, Lord! Where's the dead? They say his body had marched all the way from the Tweed, giving his warning of the English approach, all the way to here, where he remained and still does, drumming his voiceless song to warn others that dangers lurk before them. Maybe he is drumming for you. Come, it is time to use those feet. Go back out the way you came and up the stairs. Once at the road, turn right and follow it to the roundabout and past the white shop, then a little way down the Royal Mile. 
We are heading to Fish's Close. I will guide you further along the way. For now, come, come. Keep with my voice. The soldiers you heard did not live past Cromwell's coming, and the city fell with ease. There was a bloody time after. Daily hangings, whippings, nailing of legs and boring of tongues. They say faith and courage failed the Scottish people, divided, and hate and malice settled through the kingdom. But all alike, the English included, were dealt equal misery in the civil war that engulfed the common people. Cromwell, they had called the father of all murders, rebellions, treasons and treacheries, suddenly became the bearer of peace and justice, and proclaimed all liberty. In truth, he brought little more suffering than usual. The palace was burnt and a few of the kirks sacked, but little changed for either worse or better. The folk just went about their business, hauling their wares, tending to the livestock, drinking in the taverns and watching the jugglers and music folk pass away the hours. You will be seeing the royal mile ahead of you that runs from the castle to the palace and was and is the heart of Edinburgh. In the times I speak, Prince's Gardens below on the other side of the castle was just a stinking lock in which the shite of the town went, and there was little else beyond it but fields and sea. You should not think of Edinburgh as a sprawling city, but the skeleton of a fish draped out on the descending arm of a hill. Its head, the castle, its spine, the royal mile with the ribs, the many wines and closes where most of the people lived, and finally the tail, Holyrood Palace, dwarfed under rolling moors and Arthur's seat. You will be coming up to one of the most famous wines on your right, Westbow, and be seeing the white shop you are to walk past. As I said, go beyond it and once beyond the bus stop, you will see the archway leading into Fisher's Close. It is all much changed from when I was dragged here. Where you just walked would have been a row of houses shoddily built, and here, at the roundabout, blocking most road would have been an ugly, squat building, square in shape, that sat like an officious cat. Its head and square spire smelling down the Royal Mile, where it chuckled over the poor sods trundling their way up the steep slopes. It was the way house, where cheese and butter were hauled up from the grass market, or witches would have been weighed and tried, taxed or sent to death. A good place of business. It is amusing how quick the noise of the town falls away down these closes. As a child of the country, I have always felt more at home down these crowdless streets where, if you listen, you can hear the rustling of old memories still clinging on to the places they knew. You think these buildings tall, but in earlier times, they would tower over you, swamping you in darkness. The poor occupy the higher floors, whose peeling walls with their wooden beams and whitewashed rectangular faces stick out like crooked noses over the brick bases. And as the wind blows, they sway so close to each other, they almost brush. A candle flickers in the glass streetlight, but it is half obscured by the thick coating of black soot. 
Filth is thrown from the windows and runs away, becoming clogged in the straw or on the feet of the animals or people wandering about. Hear that? An old man is coming. Watch he doesn't strike you with his stick. He is in rags, stooped, worn to death's stores. He often passes by. Angus is his name. He welcomed this close in youth when he came home exuberant, washed by the sea air as a cabin boy to his young wife and child before parting again from the harbour of Leith to fare the oceans on a sailing lugger. You be a welcome sight from the rolling waves. I've been swept and rubbed raw like a faded paper red cloth of the sails. Ah, they drew us out onto the stern grey waters of the northern sea. You be not so black as the wooden hull, and this rolling now won't keep me from me bed, as ocean and gales keeps us to sleeping on our feet. I comes home smelling a fish and hard sweat, and I'm not caring warm or dry, but me wife, who soon see to that. Aye. She had none of my havers, but a short, sweet time is left for me. Soon a land will slip away, and back out I go, reaping the ocean for my bread. Ah, it's dreech in here, hoy the sky! The crows, as black as the night! Be quick about, follow the sails! What devil will I barely hear above the gale? The waves strike o'er the board that ties to cast in my flesh, and bones are frozen, the eyes blind from the salt. What is that? That voice? Singing, mocking a devil's tongue, Lily! My son can't die. His body's in war. There's no him beyond me. Boy, come back. Come back. Then if you want, then he leave me alone. He will not be a beggar's hand. Be off me, you. you devils! I'll be there, you devils! I'll cast you back to hell! Alive! Hold the line and we'll work the deck! Ah! My foot! It seizes me ankle! It bites! It bites! Crashes my foot! Ah! Ah, boys. I can still hear it. Even now. Laughing. It chases me onto the land and makes a wreck of my life. Steals the sea away from my heart. There is such pent for cruelty in our hearts. Angus became a thing of destitution, washed out of the meagre dwelling he had called home to join the filth of the streets. Wretched and idle, treated less than a dog, he dragged his foot about. Up and down the riddled winds and closes he had always come back to, chased and beaten on his leash, till on a morn they found him, dead, and dumped his body like the refuse in an unmarked pit to be forgot. He comes by often, still angry and embittered, dragging his foot, his stick still ready to strike. Come, let us walk down this close. Come, come, we will head to the bottom and right onto Victoria Terrace. There, we will walk along under the arches to the stairs and down them onto the road that leads to the grass market. Angus was not unique in his death. Few weak in constitution survived the infernal weather that blows off the sea. Neither was his treatment surprising. Many a ghost has wandered from the full and verdant way into death, hobbled and lonely. I knew a lass once, when youth was about me. We had a slight hunch. The curve in her spine snaked like a gentle river through the land. She had an awkward walk about her, her right hip thrust out, her shoulders always hunched, but her blue-green eyes were as sharp as any, like an old wolf's eyes. She was not much loved, as you might imagine. Folk thought her not right and gave her a wide berth, called her a witch, damned her to hell. No, she was not much loved. The terrace you walk upon is a new feature as is the bridge that spans over Cowgate. Before there were just houses, and in 1670, the street coming up just on your right did not end, but descend steeply to the one below, forming a Z-shape to the grass market. We will take the stairs, but imagine a half-cobbled street closed in by tall wooden-beamed houses of brick and whitewashed rectangular faces. 
each floor jutting out over the lower ones. Clothes hang from poles below the windows. Peasants, traders and denizens haul their wares up the main access road to the Royal Mile, while the shopkeepers stand in their doorways or at their work watching the rich and poor pass. And the snatches of daily conversation say much of the strange things that have been witnessed along the old curiosity of this street. What are you doing here? inside the house, a hag taller than the door, her gnarled hands are scratching, scratching the devil's mark. Right. So it has been Near the bottom of this street, staying on the side you are now, just before you walk onto Grass Market, you are to stop, just past the green cafe beneath a white sign with the hand upon it. And on the wall you will see carved, God for all his gifts, 1616. Stand with your back to it. The folk talk of the weirs whose tale I'm about to relate. Long after their death, their house was eventually pulled down, for none would stay there or even stand outside. The folk thought it might quiet the ghost of Thomas Weir, endlessly tapping his staff as he comes to see his sister. They were wrong. You hear that? Look up the street. Who comes is one of the siblings I mentioned, Thomas Weir. You may see him if you are so unfortunate. Many have, and the reports have flowed from the day they hung and burnt him. He strides about, tap, tap, tapping his way with his twisted staff, a grim face and long nose turned always to the ground, a lean body swathed in dark clothes and cloak. Be warned! Make the king the pet of malice and villainy. The very sick! of sin, where it had once been the seat of truth, its people, the guards of order. General Weir, when he was the pillar of the community, used to preach from his home, and many would come to hear him. He was thought a holy man by his brethren, the Bowhead Saints, a Protestant group of whom he was head. and mercy had been given to them by our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ, but their wickedness was infinite. And they put him to so the cross. many would hear him preach and see his spinster sister Jane, who they later called Grizzle, always at her loom and praise them both, till one day Thomas in his sermon began to proclaim all his sins. Let me alone. The torment me no more. I have laid waste to your lands, brought petulance among your livestock, and shame your family of your children. They wanted not to believe him at first, brought all manner of doctor and clergymen to absolve him, to no effect. Let me alone! I deserve no mercy from the Lord. I have lived as a beast, and I will die as a beast. They hung and burnt him, not too far from here in a more secluded spot. But his sister, Grizzle, who he always comes to find, they dragged her out from the house and brought her down here to be tried under the noose and before awaiting the fire. Look to where the old stone monument stands in the centre of the road. Here his sister, Grizzle, sanctify their sins. Listen, you stand among the crowd that watched her burn. Do you, Jane Weir, admit to laying with your brother, partaking in his villainy and performing <laughs> witchcraft? Yes, yes. I am evil, crooked, born of villainy, stamped with his mark upon my brow. Each night I wore my brother's sins, weaved them into my dresses, gave them unto you. I was always a part of him, 
be done with me. I see him in hell. Put me in the burning sand, scorch me with burning rain. I have blown from pillar to post to lay with him. I spread our evil seed among the land. Burn away! <laughs> yes, burn her, burn her. My mother was a witch, Satan's whore. Taught us all the evil that we know. The devil took us in his carriage and whispered in my brother's ear his secret counsel. I will hear no more. Have her hang. Burn her, put me to the fire, put me to the fire. I deserve to die if I shall live forever. I am wretched. Blind me with my own tears, cover me with disease, dress me in flames. I must be naked before the Lord, so all my shame is bad. Stop her from this robing. I will not bear the indecency. Throw her on the fire. Let the flames cover her. Quickly. No! No! Sometimes you can still catch the reek of her burning hair, and your mouth may water at the taste of her sizzling flesh. Even the wind that blows in the market square sometimes echoes her writhing scream. What broken shells must these two have been to beg for the justice they receive? Enough of this grim misery. You will cross the main road by a sensible place, and going left, walking away from the market, following it up to the roundabout. There, keeping to the right, you will go up the hill, along the Greyfriars courtyard to its entrance. Come, come. It may seem surprising to you, but aside from the casual burnings and hangings, of which there were many, this place was a bustling market square. The smell of dung and cattle would have been a heavy aroma to mix with the general filth of the people. Horses would have been penned up in stables between the houses and inns, and you would have seen wagons laden with goods or straw rolling through the port gate at the end of the square, and stopping here to be unloaded the bow being too steep for them to go on easily. Farmers and their work hands would have been constantly streaming back and forth from the fields with the rolling of the sun, as traders, builders, tanners, nobles, and the myriad of other people who would have flocked through watching the street entertainment and the revelers. For your father, he takes great care. Your mother combs your young hair. But the sisters say you won't get me share. If you follow me, a stranger. Do you hearken that voice singing? It is an old Scottish song, sung by young Shaw. The boy often wanders by here on his way to the graveyard. We will follow. My father may fret and my mother may frown. My sisters too, I do this own. If they were all these down below the throne, I would follow you. A good lad, but not much of a talker. I'd say they cut out his tongue, but it is more he was caught in the obnoxiousness of youth. A sprightly boy, young Shaw, like me, had a weakness for pretty lasses that were not so loved by the parent. Unlike me, however, it was not a contribution to his demise. Oh, lassie, lassie, your portion small. Perhaps it may be name at all. Your name is match for me at all. So go and wed we some mother. He was a gypsy, thus hated enough for what he was born into to deem him an outcast like the rest of his family and all his kind. The king and government were harsh upon wandering clans and often persecuted. The lassie's covers began to fail. Her rosy cheeks grew wan and pale. And the tears come trickling down the hill for a heavy shower. The boy, in fact, was hung in the grass market, not long after they burned Jane Weir and hung her brother. He had been travelling with his father and the rest of his family across the fields of Peebleshire, the land of Felon Stream not too far south of here, when they came upon another clan, the Fours. The drunken brawl that ensued sent old Four and his pregnant wife filling for the ground, and the Justice, not much enamoured by such riffraff, hung his father, old Robbie Shore, and him but with his three sons. His hand, kerchief, linen, fine. He's dried her tears and he's kissed her eyes. Oh, lassie, lassie, you will be mine. I only meant to try you. Young Shore was last to be born of his siblings, last to be hung. He had the pleasure of seeing them kick before he was dropped. The spectacle cannot have been all that interesting to the people, for they did not leave him to hang long, but cut him down first, then the rest, and carted them along the way you walk now to the graveyard where we go to finish his story. This 
He took his last and were married too. They lived in bread in the wind that grew and went a wandering in summer. So keep up the road, past the statue of that mangy dog, and just after the tavern that bears its shabby name, go right into the entrance of the graveyard. Here is the graveyard on your right. Go through and take the path on the left. We enter now into what became the local buffet for body snatchers. Take the path round to the left to the fifth crypt. It is just beyond the one that is closed and has a black plaque on it. Was in the month of sweet July, before the sun had pierced the sky, was doon among the rigs awry, I heard twa lovers talking. It is not difficult to imagine the moment back then. The noise of the town fades away. Few houses board the graveyard, and those that do, their occupants rarely look out the windows with the thick smell of damp soil. Fresh turned permeates through. Night gathers over the approaching cart, and the men, sent to bury the shores, barely sprinkle the dirt over the corpse before they hurry home beneath the sinking sun. The crypt is just coming up on your left. Gather inside with your backs to the walls, leaving the middle empty. Yes, you can hear them coming. The silence heavy as death's immortal sleep settles over the dampening ground. Only the night creatures come, slinking among the graves and pits to break the despotic peace. And two unsavoury characters, in thick cloaks, their hoods pulled low, pursue their route towards the grave mound on which you stand. Quick about you. I thought I heard the voice. There was no noise, I'd heed. Well, I marked one. Should have brought the horse. So it can make enough noise for the guards to see what we're about. Cease your daft talk and quiet yourself. Your women's skirts will be around you soon enough. Oh, well, just about. Fire your talk. With such cheapness, you should have stayed at home. Well, I don't have one to end like the court gold digger. You may be more agreeable for it. Now give me a hand, or the young surgeon won't pass off his pennies while you're whining. You have two faces about him. There's not wrong with a bit of fear for this work. It wouldn't be here. Two cents, no doubt, yes. Now keep your mind where it should be. But why they send out a search for the corpse? <laughs> for gypsies? They might. You will be. What, what was that? Keep your spade tight about you. What, what is it? Fee should I know. It's coming from about us. It's too bloody dark to see anything. Maybe some's lying in wait. Keep your wits about you, dot. Who lingers in graveyards? The bloody ground's moving. Quit your noise. Your spade. There's a sun's going out. Ah, I can see a hand and an aid. The carrion's come back alive. Get off your coward. Give me a speed. Give me a speed. Ah! Well, that will have done him. Dead or alive. Get up, man. He's not got teeth enough now to bite you. That's the devil's work. It's a wife's labour. Look, it's the lad. Oh, it's not good. They want the old one. Well, one body must cut as easy as another. Stop your whimper and help me drag it. We'll no get coins for being caught here. A charming pet. Pioneers for their day. The locals finding the boy missing from his grave supposed that in his vigour he dug his way out and escaped. Others swore they heard his animated corpse tear through the town before he was chased away by the morning star and cock's crow. We know better. Carved upon a table and his body parts dropped somewhere about, he stays unable to rest, unable to part. Enough of that, though. Let us leave this boy in peace. Gather your courage and continue along to the Black Mausoleum. Beware not to get too close. It is barred not for safety of that what is inside, but to keep what it is from coming out. Come, come. Shh. I will creep slowly. We approach the tomb of Bloody Mackenzie, who was the chief prosecutor of Scotland in the late 1600s. He sat on the trials of many witches and watched them burn. He also persecuted many Coventers, a rebellious Protestant group. He had them tortured with the boot or thumbscrew, hanged, some for doing nothing more than attending services. And, after a small uprising where the rebellion was crushed by the government forces, the captured, over a thousand, were locked up, a stone throw away from here. 
Some hung, others beheaded, while many died from maltreatment. So his justice reigned, and those that perished for it gathered round his tomb, like you, making wretched his place of rest as he did their time of life. I do not call him, for he has struck many, as yourselves, senseless, left scorch marks on their necks and back, and broken their thumbs. Some he has even driven mad, like the one who comes now, a homeless man seeking shelter on a bleak night. Gather and look through the door. Here we go. It is wet and cold, wet and cold. Need a bit of dry. I won't lie if I I'd light a fire. Don't worry yourself. I'm not coming to disturb your bones. No oh, boys' games for me. I'll just put my bundle here. Take a bit of rest. I have walked a long way. Made another hole in the shoe. Put my soaked coat here. You need not stir. I will not drip on you. No need to wake. I will sleep too. Lay myself here. Lay myself up. Side your case on the floor. Dry floor and the sound roof. A good honour. It is all you need. I had one once. A small box room of the kitchen. With a wee bit of drink beside the chair. Get out! <laughs> The floor had crumbled away from him and into a pit he fell, filled with the bones, skulls and rags of plague victims and others besides. He ran from here and did not stop. He never came back till death dragged him. Since then, people claim that Bloody Mackenzie's anger has grown even fouler. But come, before you are struck, move your feet away and back out the graveyard. Go back down the hill, but not all the way to the roundabout. You are to cross over into Merchant Street, but I will direct you more along the way. Come, come. Ah, Mackenzie was another pillar of society, and for fairness has remained so, among many. He followed the letter of the law, so those who defend him say. But the law is a fickle thing, and the common folk often get just the scraps of it, as one says, the gristle, not the meat. I have seen so many of the days pass, and watched this town fall and rise around me, and have often wondered what justice I would receive now for the mistakes I made when I was young. As you walk through the graveyard, you will see many bars over the crypts and some of the graves. These were to protect the bodies from grave robbers that became rife in the 18th and 19th century. One couldn't go a night without their sibling or parents being pinched from the earth for the surgeon's table, such is the importance of science. Two particularly disreputable fellows came up with the ingenious idea of killing for their bodies and were only arrested when a few of the surgeons and students started to recognise the people as their own relatives and thought the whole thing had gone a bit too far, such is their decency. As you walk out the graveyard and down, try not to see the statue of the cur or the busy road, but a row of houses overlooking the graveyard and beyond them a nunnery and gardens, established by the widows whose husbands had died in battle in 1513 against the English. Good times. They established a brewery not too long after, but the people loved their drink. The liquor safer than water, which is the bonus of giving everything a sheen, like time to beasts. You will be interested to know women brewed then, and it was often commoner to see a woman innkeeper than a man. Pleasant days. My lass was not half as fond as drink as I, though she did love to brew all sorts of remedies. We used to snack on red clover under the honeysuckle hangings and drink ourselves into a sleepy afternoon. As you walk down the hill, you will see, on the other side, Merchant Street. Cross and go along it under the bridge, a late addition to Edinburgh that is so built on one might mistake it for just a street. It is the Boring Bridge. The sinister one runs parallel to it and has many haunted vaults. I would take you round them, but I do not think they would let you out after. There is a stair at the end of Merchant Street leading down. Follow these to Cowgate. You might want to turn the back way too, from Paul. 
It's a bit too dark to be wandering down here, eh, laddie? The close we are about to walk through is Dyer's Close. You would have bound here an unpleasant smell of fungus, shells, mosses, plants, bark, and sheep's urine all bubbling together to make the right ingredients to dye cloth for the folk to wear. Lucky for you, the ghost that lurks here is away, as he likes to throw shite on people that pass, or so I believe. When you reach the bottom and come to the end of this close, turn right and walk down the main road, through the arches, past the three sisters, named after a trio of rowdy women singers, and on till you meet the first road leading off, called Guthrie Street. I will direct you further along the way. The Cowgate, which you now walk down, has changed much. There was no bridge before. In older days, it was the second main way through the town, and the route the farmers would have brought their cattle to the market at Grass Market, or another just beyond it, hence the name of the road, Cowgate. Gate coming from the Viking word for road or way, but the less said about those savages, the better. Yes, it was a different place then, when I came to Edinburgh. The houses would have gone up in their step-like fashion on either side, protruding over the road like crooked lovers, leaning towards each other. I often dreamed of coming here, following the farmers and my love as she went with their father to drive their cattle to market. She described the bustling nature of this way, crammed with residents and revellers, turned out on their dirty street as there was little space inside to do anything. She described the smell of the rotting vegetables in the street, the litter of wood, cloth, clay, dung and bone. Shite was thrown out through the high windows to slosh on the cows as they squeezed their way through. My girl used to make charms out of sandstone pebbles to tie round the cow's necks to keep them safe from the curses. As around hers and her father's, she made small crosses the size of buttons out of rowan twigs, tied together by lovely red cord. I often thought we would come here together, but it was not to be. You'll be seeing Guthrie Street come up on your right. Cross the Cowgate, being careful not to be run over. Now go through the opening in the building on the opposite side. We leave the madness of the crowd behind so I can draw out the ghosts of my next tale. you will see a cobbled road turning left. Follow this round till you see a set of stairs leading up a long close. Go up till you reach the blue door. Listen out for someone following you. Death has not made her kind. You will notice around about you it is all quite open, but before the house would have been stacked together in long rectangular blocks, accessible only by the narrow winds that lead from the Royal Mile down to the Cowgate. The buildings may seem tall now, but they were titanic then. 
Their upper floors leaning out and over, filthy and dark. A walled city like Edinburgh had little option to build out, only up and very cramped. The alley itself, Borthwick's Close, was named after the prestigious residents, the Borthwicks, who have a castle 12 miles south of here. It is an old and grim castle, though pleasant in its way, and it is steeped in ghosts, as one would expect from a fort. Mary, Queen of Scots herself, the second cousin of Queen Elizabeth I, took refuge there during a siege. She died elsewhere, but she still comes back to walk the halls and passages from time to time, her head half hanging off. There is a room in Borthwick Castle called the Red Room, where many sinister things have passed, but none so unsavoury as a killing of a pregnant maid. Go up to the blue door and drain pipe and gather on the step before it. As I was saying, the young laird of Borthwick Castle, who liked his women, had his way with one, Ellie, till he discovered her pregnant and slashed her stomach open, killing them both. Her ghost can be seen there still, in the moment of the act, but also she wanders about here, a bundle in her hands. Folks say she followed the laird to Edinburgh. Maybe to escape her cries. Maybe. The place he stayed was somewhere just above you. Hush, my child. Hush. Bring them down. That is her now. Be cautious not to get in her way. She goes on her winding walk. Soon she will enter as they sit around a table ready to eat. Listen. In the kitchen, the pots boil and a bird is roasting over the fire and the cook is redressing the scully maid. You mind that doesn't burn? Yes, ma'am. Cook will be good enough for you. Yes, cook. I just thought I heard my name. Rubbish. I've been in his lord's kitchen since I could hold your mother in my arms. I know what it's about. Never known the days. Taken from home and country to be cooped up in this room. No peace from the outside. Jays and drabs walking past all hours. You'll put a decent woman to shame. It is a noisy place, Cook. I miss the river and fetching the water from the hills. None of that sauciness, girl. Ellie liked fetching all manner of things from odd places, but it did her no good. You cross the handle and turn the fowl. One poor flock of the other tools you play with. Do you hear me? Taken from my own country. You mind Jack doesn't make you a drudge, Hetty. He's a master and all, and God bless him, but he's got an eye for instance to make the devil blush. Yes, Cook. I will look for trouble. No, but trouble finds us. From the vanishing of poor Ellie and us moving here and being hounded by harlots, it should set anyone on guard. Now you take that dish through to the dining room. The plate won't carry itself. My lowly scullery maid, I never thought I would see the days. And to see round sugar houses taken from home and country, poor lasses. It's a fruitless life for drills of all common trades. Do you hear that, Hetty? A bad service no better than a slave, the Lord of Barrington. Yes, good. They shut the place after for a long time, none wanting to return, the cutlery lay still dropped on the table or scattered on the floor. The food still ready on the plates, the chairs turned over, or pulled back to be occupied, and the burnt fowl still waits in its place in the hearth. Hush, my child. Hush. Bring them down. The girl was never seen after, never mentioned and barely missed, except by the mother and cook, who never spoke again, not even in death. So, love and grief can make us do terrible things, as misfortune and hardship can bring the worst as it does the best. We will not linger here. The last stretch is before us. Come, let us keep pace. We will walk to the end of this close and coming on to the Royal Mile, on the stretch they call the High Street. Turn left and head up to the small tree before the cathedral. Come, come. Once opposite the tree, on the other side of the Royal Mile, you will see an opening to Writer's Court. Go through and inside. Gather just to the left on the wide clearing at the top of the long stairs. I will tell you there the last tale and the terrible things that man has done in the darkest hours. But we walk back in history, a time even before the first stories I told you of the soldiers and the drumming boy. Five years, in fact, 
In 1645, when the bubonic plague that had spread its way from the east through Europe and England, annihilating the population, finally reached Scotland. It moved like an invisible breath, unstoppable, indifferent to man, woman or child. It festered on the foul weather and the fetid, congested living condition of the time. Through villages that disappeared and towns which became as silent as graveyards did it drift. The streets emptied, the houses became gravestones, visited only by the foul cleansers whose job it was to drag away the dead and dying and burn their belongings. You will be seeing the small tree. Go through the opening opposite and gather at the top of the stairs. As well as burning bodies, they were dumped in huge pits out on the moors that surrounded the town. Men would walk around in thick cloaks and beaked masks, and the sickly sweet smell of incense mingled with the rotting of food and corpses pervaded throughout. Fear became palpable, and life, however dire, became a luxury. Here is the close. Gather inside on the left at the top of the second set of stairs. Those who broke curfew would be hung in their doorways, and after the pestilence had passed, many houses remained shut, none left to return, died in terrible pain of lumps and blood. Settle yourselves just down the first flight of stairs, in Mary King's Close, the squalor of poverty near where you stand now, people thought to have the plague were bricked into their houses still alive. The plague sprinkled the rich on the earth like a touch of salt at the table, but the poor and middling it poured like broth. We cannot follow her. She goes into Mary King's close that was partly demolished and bricked over, but is still accessible. If you have the chance and wish to see an echo of the wretchedness, you should go. For now, though, I will present her tale of the many like her. Throw your mind into a small, dingy room. No furniture, just a bit of poor bedding and a flickering candle. Through the narrow door outside, the street is not much better than a sewer. The light dark, a close that looks never to have felt the sun. Have you seen my doll? No, dear. Try not to move. You're weak. Lay back. Rest. How long till I can go out and play? Is that Maddie? No. Uh, she's sleeping. Like her mother and father? Yes, God bless them. She was the last. You must be a good girl and sleep as well. Will you sleep? No, but I will not be far away. And Daddy? He comes with me. You be a brave girl. We will be back soon with your two brothers. Hush. And little Johnny? He played with Maddie. With God. Will we see him soon? Yes. Together with his grace. It hurts. <coughs> <coughs> it hurts. I am tired. I feel someone sitting on me. You hush now. It will not be long now. You sleep. It is time. You stay away, son. Annie. We will be back soon. You be brave there. I love you, my child. <laughs> Hush now. Sleep. Hello? Mammy? Jack? Daddy? Mammy? Hello? The candle has gone out. I can't see. Where is the door? I can't find the door. Help! Help! Mammy! It seems unspeakable what some people do, but often you will find they were not evil. Indeed, I think we look for monsters to hide our own shame in their shadow. So it was for me. Come, come, let us walk away out onto Royal Mile and head over to the tree, just opposite, and gather there. You have followed me on this journey to listen to the tales of the souls that haunt these streets, and there is just one little story left to hear. Mine. We are in the bustling heart of Edinburgh, the heart of Midlothian, and exactly in the middle of the high street here stood the Tollbooth, a prison. My girl often spoke of it, a grim, haggard building that lay like a snake, a tall, thick body of black windows, cresting spires and gloomy chimneys, its head a protruding ground floor with a flat roof stuck out towards the castle. A house of squalor for thieves, murderers and innocent folk alike. And just down from it, by Borthwick Close, the Market Cross stood, a focal point for trade and executions. My girl and her old wolf's eyes saw this place many times, but I... Only once, on a sunny day as I was dragged behind a cart, ashen face, eyes wild, at the people, the rotting heads, the ghastly grey prison looming above, they strapped me to a body-length board beside the cross with ropes round my ankles and wrists that led to winches. They winded me apart, pulling me in all directions till my joints popped, my skin tore, my screams broke and I was left a ruin, held together only by clothes. 
I was one of the only men in Scotland to die on the rack. My punishment for the crime of killing my father when he forbade me to marry a common girl. An act of madness in a moment of despair. I told my tribunal the devil had possessed me. They did not believe me. They believe only in ghosts and devils when it suits them. So now you know my story, my unspeakable act, my terrible death. I can never quit this place after that. Shades that arrive now tell me justice is better, life is better, and yet still so many remain, trapped by their death, their mistakes, their shame. And so it was for me, so it is for them. I thank you for listening to me. You are free to go and I to begin this work anew, but I am sure we will meet again. As what chance have any of us to be free of here? And not inmates come to join the ranks in the cramped and ceaseless cry of this Dreek house. An All Things Creative Audio Production. Written by Francois Oliveau. Sound design by Tomasz Fritekl. Artwork by Sara Seshla Naras. Narrated by Fergus Head and acted by Rory Rorison, Hem Cleveland, Jesse Hurtado, Dan Rowell. Leonie McClay, Lola Aluko, and Peter Wallace. With special thanks to Finlay Neal for the children's voices and to Maud Stark for Ellie's voice and press release. Luke Reynard, Guy Perring, Mark Cheriton, John Wilshire, Sam Ferris, and Javier Padiz for the crowd's voices. Hilly Cow Wigwams for letting us record their animals, the Georgian House National Trust for Scotland, and the Scottish Wildlife Trust for letting us use their space. And a huge thank you to our valued sponsors, Seinheiser and Studio Care Professional Audio Limited.